there is not. Good morning, church, and thank you so much for joining us today. What a gorgeous day it is. Amen. Well, let's stand today, and this is the day that the Lord has made. He gave us breath this morning. He gave us life today, and, and, and ultimately that, that leads to one purpose, and that is to honor glorify and enjoy our God forever. So let's sing to the God of the universe today who is worthy of his name. Rumors of the Son of Man Stories of a Savior Holiness with human hands Treasure for the trader No ear had heard, no eye had seen The image of the Father Heaven came to live with me, a rescue like no other. You are worthy. You are worthy of your name. You are.
Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow night. You may have seen some construction materials back in the back. If you're able to stay after church for a little while and help us, any help would be appreciated as we convert this into a beach and waves and a pier and all kinds of things that are going to be going on uh, this week here at VBS. Um, if you're able to stay, if I could, if you could raise your hand, we're actually going to feed you. We're going to buy some pizza. Uh, can somebody get a count? I, I, I'll try it. Let's see you. One, two, three, four, five, six. A lot, Sue. So just order a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's uh, like 26. We'll say, no, 28. 28. We'll say 28. 30. We'll say 30. Okay. <laughs> Good luck. She's in charge of ordering pizza. So if it doesn't go right, you, you know why. <laughs> it's right, right here. <laughs> So anyway, so that's right after church, we'll be setting up, and then um, 
Uh, upward soccer evaluations are from 6 to 8 tonight. We've already got 130, 140 kids registered for upward soccer and, and more coming tonight. Uh, VBS, we have close to 40 kids pre-registered already. Um, that's fantastic. So it's going to be a fun week. I'd like to encourage you to stop by and check it out. Um, there are always little things that need to be done. Uh, kids just, you know, if we just have people interming intermingling with the kids and sitting with them and just sitting in the classrooms, um, it's always just a great week. And, and the reason why we do this, I, I just want to always come back to this, is because, you know, God loves kids. And I think that in our society, sometimes they're overlooked, you know, especially in church. And we want to make sure that we have a week for them that is just just crazy, incredible. They're going to have fun. They're going to sing songs that are just for them. They're going to listen to my bad jokes and laugh. You know, I, I train them to laugh at the beginning. Um, it's just going to be a good week. So I appreciate all your help and those who are willing to stay. And if you would, just really pray about the things that are coming up. Just a great opportunity to share our community that God loves them, and, and so do we. Let, let's pray together. Most Holy God, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for all that you do. And God, we're excited about today. We're excited about the opportunities that you have placed before us. Just to love people in your name. And you tell us that, that you, you, you gave us this example of what it looks like to follow you. And it's, it's by serving. It's by serving others and loving others. And God, I just thank you that, that our church loves to do that. Lord, I just pray that you just bless our service today. That you would be honored. That you would be pleased. God, for each person that's here, for those who are joining us online... God, speak to our hearts, draw us closer to you. We just love you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary. Perfect Holy One crushed your son. I drank the bitter cup reserved for me. Cause your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Won't you end up?
Thanks and be seated. At this time, we'll dismiss our children for Children's Church. And, uh, wow. <laughs> we're, we're going through this series, and it's called The Story of the Bible. So we're going to go through a, a few more weeks, and we're going to kind of go in a different direction for, for about five or six weeks. And then we're going to jump back into this story, and we're going to kind of mix it up a little bit. But uh, this morning we're looking at Abraham and looking at a story in the Bible that if you've been around church, you've probably heard. Um, it's this kind of crazy story where uh, God, you know, we, we kind of started off talking about Abraham several weeks ago. And God tells Abraham, he said, I want you to leave your country. I want you to go to a place that I'll show you. And Abraham leaves. He's not sure where he's going. But he obeys God, just he has this incredible faith, and that's, that's why we're talking about him today. And uh, so he leaves his family, and he, and he goes to this land, and God promises him that he will make him a great nation, and through him, through his seed, all nations would be blessed. And he's basically saying that through Abraham, God is going to bring Isaac and then Jacob, whose name is going to be changed to Israel, and and then God is going to use Israel, this nation of Israel, to be a light to the world, to show people who God is. And then through this nation, through Abraham's seed, ultimately Jesus comes. And so as we look at this, we see, we see God doing this. And at 63 years old, Abraham packs up everything, and he leaves, and he moves. At 71 years old, eight years later, God promises him again. I know it's been eight years but this is what I've promised, and this is what I'm going to do. And Abraham believes again. Now, 23 years after the original promise, as, as Andrew was talking about last week, um, angels show up, and they still don't have a baby, right? Uh, Abraham's now 93 years old, um, and, and they don't have a baby yet. These angels show up, they say, you're still going to have a baby. God's going to make this happen. And, and we see that that that. At 100 years old, uh, Abraham has a baby. Sarah has a baby. And it's kind of crazy. Isaac is born, this, this child of promise. And so if you kind of put that in perspective, God makes this promise. And then he waits all of these years later, you know, 37 years until the promise is actually fulfilled. And, and so, so this amazing miracle happens and this baby that Sarah's been longing for, and this, this, this young one that, that Abraham and Sarah have been praying about, it, it's theirs. And, and, they, and they raise this child, and now the child's about 20 years old, and then God comes to him and tells him something that's just so, so unbelievable. But, but let's read it. Genesis chapter 21. It says now, it talks about when I'm giving them the, the baby. It says, now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. And Sarah became pregnant, bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. And when his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Now Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God's brought me laughter. I didn't think I'd hear laughter like this in my house. And, and everyone who hears about that will laugh with me, and, and they'll be excited with me. And, and she added, who would have said that to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I've born him a son in his old age? You know, Sue and I can, can kind of relate to this. We weren't super old, but we didn't know if we were going to be able to have kids. Um, we, we, uh, you know, we went through all the infertility stuff, and, and we, we weren't sure that we were going to be able to actually have children. And and, uh, and then Matt came along, and then five years later, Jenna came along, and God bless. But I can tell you, it's, it's an amazing thing when you're, you kind of begin to think, you know, is this going to happen? And then it happens. And many of you have, may have been there, and some of you may, may be there right now. 
So that, that makes what God's getting ready to say um, even, even kind of crazier. In Genesis chapter 22, we see that God tests Abraham. And it's not an easy test. In Genesis 22, it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, Abraham said, here I am. Uh, then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. I mean, think about that. They waited 29 years. God promised he'd bless the whole world through Isaac. And then God tells Abraham to take Isaac and go and sacrifice him. Why would the God of the universe command Abraham to do something like this? I mean, it's, it's why do this to, to Abraham? Can you imagine what Abraham's, Abraham's heart must have done when now then he's, his son's almost 20 years old and the son of promise, the son that he's waited for, and then God says, I want you to take the thing that's closest to you I want you to be willing to let go of it. I want you to give them to me. And uh, it, it's kind of crazy to think about just the, the, the mental anguish that Abraham must have gone through at this time. Um, and especially when we know how the story turns out, we know that God delivers and, and God provides another sacrifice. And um, we, we know that if God knew that he was going to deliver Isaac, why do this to Abraham? As we read this story, we're going to see that there are so many reasons. It, it shows us what faith looks like. Faith believes even when we don't understand. Faith believes even when we don't understand. It, it, it's shown that the nation of Israel, who's going to come from a Abraham, they're going to tell this story over and over again. And they're going to be reminded that God provides. It's, it's going to teach us that God keeps his promises. It's going, to, it's going to teach us to show obedience. I mean, you got to realize, this is a story about Abraham taking his son. But, you know, if, if you know, when you go back and you read and you see that Abraham's son Isaac is somewhere around 20 years old or so, you know, Isaac is, Abraham's old. Isaac is in his prime. And this is Isaac agreeing to this. This is Isaac going and not understanding. He's following his dad. He's doing what he says. But then this is Abraham going up. And it doesn't give a lot of description about what happens. But at some point along this journey, Isaac asks his dad, here's the wood. You know, here's the fire. Where's the sacrifice? And somewhere they had to have a conversation where Abraham explains it. And we see all this and it just kind of shows that, that God, God steps in and he provides, right? This wasn't about Abraham, God wanting Abraham to actually sacrifice his son Isaac. It's about God wanting to show Abraham and God wanting to show us that we need to be willing to let God first in our lives above everything and above all else. God sometimes tests us. Now, I, I realize a lot of churches don't like to talk about that, but I think it's very important that we do. Life is not always going to be easy. It just isn't. You can't read anywhere in the Bible where it says that if you become a believer that your life will be perfect and you'll never have any problems. And in fact, James chapter 1 says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You see, as you, as you look at this, what God tells us, he tells us, is that there's something that is actually necessary for us to grow in our relationship with Christ, and that is to face adversity. Sometimes God allows adversity to come into our lives, and it's actually for our benefit and for his glory. And sometimes God doesn't just allow it. Sometimes God causes it. And we say, well, how can God do that if he loves us? How can God allow these hard things to happen in my life? But the reality is that there are some things we will never know about God or never know about ourselves until we are tested. Adversity builds character. If we'd never had a problem, we'd never know what faith in God looked like. I, I know we talk about this sometimes at our church, but I think it's important to understand that. It, it is, is that, is that it, I don't grow when things are easy. Do you? 
I, it's, it's not always when everything goes the way I want it to go, when life is easy. In fact, I find that in those times, I tend to kind of coast, and I kind of feel like, in, in my mind sometimes, maybe I don't need God as much as when it's, there are adverse circumstances in my life. The reality is there's some things we never know about God or ourselves until we're tested. And sometimes God allows difficulties in our lives or uses the difficulties that, that are in our lives to reveal who He is. You see, difficulties are the great testing ground. What will you do when life gets hard? Will you turn to God or will you turn from God? Abraham turned to God even when it would cost that which is most precious to him. That's faith, right? Abraham had been promised Isaac and he gives he takes Isaac up the mountain to obey God and to say, God, you're the most important thing in my life. You see, obedience is the test of faith. Will you do what God tells you to do? Now, we're not going to be asked, most of us, to, to any of us probably, to do anything like Abraham was asked. But we are asked to, by faith, believe what God says and to step out and to obey Him. We are asked to, 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 to follow Him even when life doesn't seem to make sense and even though we don't understand exactly where it's going or, or how it's going to work out. We are asked to believe Him even though we've been praying about something for a long time and it hasn't happened yet. We are asked to believe Him, even though what we're praying for, you know, it may, be, it may not be answered in the way that we wish or hope that it would be, but we trust that God has a bigger plan, like He's revealed all throughout the Bible, that there's more than I can see sometimes going on, and obedience is this test of faith. Will I follow God's commands? Will I do what He tells me to do? Will I listen to Him? And the reason why we're talking about Abraham this morning is because Abraham says, I'm going to be that guy. Now, you look at Abraham's life, Abraham did not always get it right. If you look at the things that he did, he messed up plenty of times. But Abraham had this thing, is that he believed God, he believed his promises, and he would do what he said. And John 14, 15 tells us that that's kind of the key of where this all starts. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, right? It doesn't say, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments when they're easy, it says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You'll do what I say. The interesting thing about this is, God comes to Abraham and he tells him to do this, to take his son Isaac and to take him and sacrifice him, right? And when you read this, this is kind of crazy. It, it doesn't say that Abraham prayed about it. It doesn't say that he, he prayed and fasted for a couple of weeks and then he decided to follow God. It doesn't say he had a long conversation with Abraham and Sarah, had this long conversation to discuss what they should do. It, it, it doesn't say any of those things. God tells him, and we're going to read in a minute, that the very next day he gets up and he takes Isaac and they start walking toward the mountain. If God's words told us something, we don't need to pray about it. You know, there are some things that we don't need to pray about. If, if God's word is, has revealed that it's right, then we need to do it. If God's word is revealed that it's wrong, then we need to not do it. It's really pretty simple, right? Abraham said, God said it. I don't understand it. I'm going to trust God, and I'm going to obey. Now, that, that sounds on the surface kind of like you're saying, that sounds kind of like a blind faith. It's not a blind faith. Because Abraham has already seen all the things that God has done in his life. God's already revealed himself to him in so many ways, right? This is just the next step in his faith journey. And so as you read this in Genesis 22, it says early the next morning, he didn't even wait. He probably wasn't sleeping a lot, to be honest, that night. But it says early the next morning, Abraham got up, loaded his donkey, took with him two servants and his son Isaac. And when he cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, you stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We'll worship and we'll, we will come back to you. It's interesting, what's he say? We'll worship and what's he say? Who's going to come back to him? We will come back to you. Abraham 
from the very beginning of this, doesn't understand what's going to happen, but in his heart, he knows that God has promised that he was going to use Isaac, that through Isaac, all nations would be blessed. So he doesn't know how it's going to happen. He just knows he's going to do what God says, and he believes that God will keep his promises. So he says, we, we will come back to you, right? And so as we go, I'm sure Abraham's wondering what's going to happen. And as they continue on, uh, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac, and he, he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father, uh, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So Abraham doesn't understand. He just knows he's going to obey. Listen, we've all been there, right? Haven't we? we we've all had things that have happened in our lives and, and that we've not understood. If you haven't, you will, right? But the amazing thing that God does in our lives, and, and you, you, you won't really understand this unless, unless you've given your life to Him, is that God has this ability when things are hard and we're facing things that we don't understand and we may even question, we, you know, we, don't, we don't know, God has this ability to step in and, and, and just give us this, this peace that we can trust Him. And Abraham experiences that. Isaac, I don't understand, but God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So you got to have to ask yourself the question, right? How could Abraham do something like this? How, how could Abraham do something like this? How could you take your son, who you've waited that long for, who you love so much, and you'll see phrases being used as you, as you read this story. Your son, your one and only son, your, your only son. You see those kind of driven home in this passage of Scripture. God's wanting us to understand that, that this, was, this was a hard thing for, he was asking Abraham to do, right? How could he do it? Genesis 22, it says, And the two of them, they went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there, arranged the wood on it. Nothing's happened yet, right? He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Nothing's happened yet. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Nothing's happened yet, right? How do you go that far? What's going through Abraham's mind at this moment? I, I can't even imagine how he was able to do something like this, right? But here's the thing that we sometimes forget. Remembering what God has done makes it easier to remember what God can do. God, this isn't the first time Abraham has stepped out by faith and seen God answer a prayer. This isn't the first time that Abraham has trusted God and God has proven that, that he is good and that he is loving, and God has proven that his way works and that it's right, right? So Abraham's not just saying, starting here, and, and, and just, just saying, you know, I, I, I can't even, you know, why, how am I doing this? It's, he, he's looking back, he's thinking about all the times that God has provided in his life, time and time and time again, and by this time there have been so many things that God has done, Abraham just expect God to show up and do something, Right? This isn't a blind faith. This isn't Abraham going out and just rip. This is God building a trust in Abraham's life to the point where Abraham believes that God can do what he says he's going to do. And listen, we have the same thing in our lives. Remembering what God has done makes it easier to believe what God can do. That's why God tells us at the beginning of every prayer when he teaches us to pray, he tells us in everything with thanksgiving let your request be made known to God, right? What, what, what is, what's the purpose of beginning our prayers with thanksgiving? Why, why does he tell us to do that? 
Because every time we say thank you for this, God is reminding us, reminding ourselves, God did this for me. God was there when I needed him in this time. God met this need. God has supplied this for me. He has given me food. He's given me a home. He's given me this awesome family. God has given me a job. He's given me you know, this time where I needed him. He showed up and he helped me. And, and so as we begin to thank God over and over and over again for these things that he's done, it becomes easier to believe that God can do that again in the future. David didn't start with Goliath. David started off as a shepherd, and he started off protecting his sheep, and, and the wild animal would come to take the sheep, and it talks about him killing a lion. It talks about him killing a bear. It talks about him doing these things, and, and, and these, these small steps of faith, these small, small acts, acts of obedience as he trusted God, they began to build this trophy case in his life that he could go back and look at and say, this is what God has done. I can't wait to see what God's going to do next. That's why these, these men were able to do these incredible things and these women in the Bible. Because God has done things in your life too, but we too quickly forget what God's done in our lives. You know, one of the things we, we tell the story at our church a lot about when we were building our church and kind of some of the, the things that, we, that happened with our church and the way God miraculously provided. I mean, just time and time again, just in phenomenal ways. And I'll just, if you're new, I'll just throw out just a few things. But I mean, we, we were, we, we, we had a free labor crew promise to come in and build the church. We waited a year for them. We had materials delivered. And then the day before, uh, the week before they're supposed to start, they call and they say they're not going to be able to come. That, that made a huge difference in the cost of our church. They were going to come in and put it all under roof and, and get it ready. And we began to look and reevaluate. And, and we, were, we, we looked and we were short. And we began looking at how much we were short. We were about $90,000 short. And we, what do we do? You know, we were a small church. We didn't have an organization behind us supporting us. You know, what do you do? And, and then we, so we said, we're going to step out by faith. God's met each need along the way. I don't know how he's going to do it. We're going to trust them to do this. And then what happens? A few weeks later, uh, guess how much we received? We received an anonymous donation of, guess how much? $90,000, right? It happens, you know? And then as we get further in the project, these other problems would come up, and we'd be like, well, you know, if God can provide $90,000, then... Uh, he can handle this, you know, let's go on, you know, we, so we kept going, and then we come all the way down to the end, you know, and, and then the, the county decides that we need a, a, an alarm system that we weren't aware of, and, and then it was like four grand or something like that, and we literally, you have to understand, we, we have hundreds of dollars maybe in our checking account, you know, and, and so what do you do, you know, so we pray about God, you know, we need $4,000, guess what shows up in the mail that week? A check for $4,000. I'd applied for a grant two years before, and they sent a check for $4,000 the week that I needed $4,000. Crazy. We get ready to move into our church, and uh, uh, everything, Hamilton County signs off. If you've ever worked with Hamilton County's building department, that itself was a miracle from God, right? <laughs> they give us occupancy, and uh, Crosby Township had changed zoning inspectors, and the zoning inspector had signed off on our plans, but the new zoning inspector said, no, you have to pave your parking lot. We're going to leave it gravel for a year, let it settle, save some money, and then, put, then, then pave it. The, uh, the new zoning inspector said, no. I said, look, you know, here are the plans that you signed off. You're, you know, the city signed off on them. He said, I don't care. This, you have to do it. We got a bid to put the base coat down. Just a base coat of blacktop was $16,000. We have a church. We're meeting in the high school. Um, we have a church that's completely ready to move into, and we can't move in. And that Sunday morning, I just made the announcement. I said, hey, look, this is where we are. Uh, we need to pray about this. And there was a new family that came to church that Sunday. And that Sunday night, they came back, and they said, can we meet with you after church? I said, sure. And they sat down with me. And this is their first Sunday at our church. They sat down with me, and they said, we found some extra money in a cookie jar, and they wrote a check for, guess how much? $16,000, right? I mean, it happened. Those kinds of things happen so many times. 
you know, as, as we were building the church, and as, as, as we've seen those things happen in our church. If you step out by faith, you're going to experience those kinds of things in your life. If you sit back and wait for God to, 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 to make a way and God to do everything before you step out, it's just not the way God works. God told Abraham, get up and move, and, and Abraham started walking. God told Abraham, go sacrifice your son, and Abraham got up the very next morning early and started walking towards the mountain with his son. You see, when you start stepping out by faith, and you start believing God keeps his promises and that God can meet your needs, and that God, you, you, it gets easier and easier as you begin to see the things God's doing. Now, if something comes up you know, with our church, or there's something that comes along, we look back and we say, well, God did this, and God did that, and we had to have a certain meeting, and God worked this out, and God did all these things. It gets easier to believe because God has proven himself. But you never experience that until you begin to walk in faith. What's it mean? It means you believe when it's hard. It means you believe when you don't know the answers. And then you sit back and you wait and you trust God because you say, I'm so far and over my head, I don't know what to do. Remembering what God has done makes it easier to believe what God can do. So Hebrews chapter 11, we, we, we find out what, what, what's going through Abraham's mind here. This is in Hebrews in the New Testament. It says, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Why? Verse 19. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back for the dead. You understand what's going on here? Abraham, God had proven himself so many times to Abraham. And Abraham had such a faith in God. And the more you know God, the more you'll trust him. The more you get to experience him in your life, the more that you know that you can trust him. I'm not talking about a blind faith where you just go out. This, this is a God who has proven himself time and time again, right? Abraham believed that God could even raise the dead. He so believed God's promise that he believed that if he sacrificed Isaac, that God would still keep his promise because God is God and God doesn't lie. So when he placed Isaac on the altar, when he places the wood, when he gets out his knife, Abraham's not holding back. He believes God. Abraham believed that God would keep his promises, and you need to believe that too. It's an amazing thing. God doesn't lie. God does what he promises. And in Romans 4.18, it says, Against all hope, Abraham and hope still believed. So he became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Romans 4.19, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. Why does God allow sometimes difficult circumstances into our lives? Because it grows our faith. Because when we, in faith, believe God, when we, against hope, believe and have hope, it brings glory to God. It, it, people look and say, well, look what God promised. He's holding on to God's promises. And, and so he's, he believes and she believes. And, and so look at this. How's that, how's that even possible? And it begins to point people to God. And that's what God's looking for, right? Our purpose in life is to bring glory to God. And having faith in God when life is hard, when you don't understand, brings glory to God. So there may be times in your life where God allows you to be in situations that require faith. And when others see your faith, it points them to God. Romans, Romans 4.20, it says, he, Abraham didn't waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. That's, that, that verse is kind of hard to understand. But as you learn to trust God, you learn you can trust God. 
I don't know how to describe it. You begin to trust them in little things, and God begins to meet, think, meet your needs in bigger ways. As you begin to trust them in bigger ways, God begins to meet those needs in even bigger ways. There's nothing God can't do. There's a plan. And Abraham said, I don't understand it, but I'm going to trust him, even if it means believing that God will raise my son. How does he get that kind of faith? Um, we may be saying, you know, I, I, I have struggles and I, I don't have that kind of faith. How did Abraham get that kind of faith? Romans ten seventeen says, faith comes by hearing, right? Faith comes by hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ, right? Abraham didn't have a written Bible to read. He was living it. But he heard the word of God from God. And he clung to God's word, and he strengthened his faith. His, his faith. So what's that mean? It means that when we read God's word, reading that, it instills faith. Reading his promises enable us to do what we think more than we, th we think or we should be able to do. It's, it's, it's clinging to his promises. You'll, you'll never know then, if, if you read his word, you'll never really understand. I, I'm going to share something. You know, I, uh, this is hard for me to do. You know, I, you know I, everybody likes to project that you come across and you don't have any problems and that you never struggle. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm going to tell you that, that like you, if you will admit it, I struggle sometimes too. The past couple months for me, it's, it's been kind of weird um, I've had some things going on that, that just, you know, we use the word stress, and that we, we use that word, and it seems to be this undefinable word. It's like a feeling, you know? But, but stress is, if you start breaking it down, the, the root component of stress is fear, right? It's a fear that you won't be able to perform. It's a fear that things won't work out. It's a fear that something bad is going to happen. It's, it's, a, it's a fear, that just begins to consume you. And we call that stress, right? And, and as we look at that, I, it was just kind of weird. It's just, I had this time where it just seemed like this, it's irrational, it was irrational. You know, why, why would I feel like this? I, you, know, you can read, you know, you, you know but, but you still have these feelings. You, know, you still have this, this anxiety or this stress that, that, that goes on. And so I, I started, I was reading Psalms. And, I, you, know, I, you know, I think I've shared this, but, you know, and I'm, I'm still doing it. It's so encouraging. I'm going I'm to just keep doing it for a while. But each day I would read, like today, Psalm 10. So I'd read Psalm 10 and 30, read Psalm 40, uh, Psalm 70, Psalm 100, Psalm 110, Psalm 140. And every month you read through Psalms, right? But as I was going through, I thought, I'm going to start highlighting some stuff on my phone. So I started start highlighting some things. And the crazy thing is, is that during this period of time, these psalms, just, God just began to speak to me. Now, did he say, Doug, this is crazy. Why you should be feeling like this? Why you have these feelings? No, he didn't say that, right? But I can't explain it, but I'm reading these psalms that I've read so many times before, but now I'm reading them, and I know God is talking to me through these psalms. Now, I'm gonna, I just, so I thought, I'll just grab a few of these that I had highlighted. I bet I've got 60 or 70 highlights just related to just this. I just grabbed a few. I'm reading Psalm 55, and I'm kind of struggling a little bit. It says, cast your cares on the Lord. He'll sustain you. He'll never let the righteous be shaken. And I'm like, wow, God, did you just say that to me? That's, that's cool. That's, that's a promise. Psalm 115, you who fear him, trust in the Lord. He's their help and their shield. You want to help me? Psalms 86, when I'm, dis when I'm in distress, I call to you because you answer me. Psalm 116, I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. God hears me. Psalm 31, 7, I will be glad and rejoice in your love for you saw my affliction. You knew the anguish of my soul. You understand what I'm going through. You see, when you're, when you're going through circumstances in your life and you begin to read God's word, it, it, you may have read it 
a hundred times before, and it can be completely different based on what you're going through. That's the way God speaks to you through his word. Psalm 91.1, whoever dwells in a shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 43.5, why, my soul, are you downcast? This doesn't make sense. Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Psalm 16, I keep my eyes always on the, on the Lord. With him at right, my right hand, I won't be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, my body will also rest secure. Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength in ever-present tra- help and trouble, right? I mean, they're on and on and on. I've read these verses so many times, but when you're in that place with whatever it is you're going through, God just seems to take his word and it makes it just personal to you. And what happens is, I, as you read these promises, the, the fears just begin to go away. As you read these promises, the faith just tends to grow. And you're reminded who God is and what he can do. That's why we talk so much about reading, reading your Bible. Even if it's just five minutes a day or in our daily bread or one of the daily devotions from, from the U Bible, U Version Bible. You know, there are so many ways to do it. But spend some time there because that's how God grows us. And that's how he grew Abraham. So as you look at this and you see this, what Abraham knew was that God keeps his promises, right? God promised him. Abraham knows that God keeps his promises. So he's not going to stress out. He's not going he's to obey him. He doesn't understand, but he's going to obey him. Let's, let's just read the story, just finish the story out. It says, so Abraham's there, Isaac's on the altar. Genesis 22 says, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham says, here I am, he replied. And the angel said, don't lay a hand on the boy. Don't do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So God provided. And as we begin to read the story, does it sound a little bit familiar? Right? Because the story is bigger than Abraham and Isaac. It's God helping us to understand what he's going to someday do in sending Jesus. We needed someone to take our place. And God provides a sacrifice. He provides his son. He provides Jesus. It's so cool. This is just what Abraham does, right? Abraham looks at this mountain. He says, I think I'm going to call this place the Lord will provide. (laughs) You know, (laughs) that's pretty cool, right? And then every time they walk past that mountain, what's he think about? The Lord will provide. Every time Isaac walks past this mountain, what's he going to think about? The Lord will provide. It eventually gets the name, the Lord will provide, right? And so Israel, you know, as, there, as they become in, in that area, every time they look at that mountain, they look and they remember the story of Abraham and Isaac, and they're reminded, God provides. That's just what he does. Verse 15 says, The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven the second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, because you've done this and not without your son, your only son. Just like I'm going to do someday, right? God was saying, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. Though your offspring, through your offspring, all the nations on earth be blessed because you obeyed me. You know why Israel's in Israel right now? Because of God's promise to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 15. It, 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 God keeps his promise. And as you go through and as, as you look at this, we see that, that Abraham was made righteous because of what he believed, not, not because of what he did. I, this is kind of a fine line. I'll, I'll just go through this pretty quickly. But the reality is, The reality is that 
in Romans 4, Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of the Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? So Abraham, through all this, understands, figures out what it's like to be made right with God. How do you become made right with God? And it goes on and it says, if his good deeds made him acceptable to God, he would have something to boast about, but that was not God's way. What's that mean? That means that if Abraham was, was made righteous because of what Abraham did in offering to sacrifice Jesus, I mean, sacrifice Isaac, right? If Abraham was made righteous because of what he did, then he could say, look what I did. Look what I did that caused me to be righteous. But he goes on and he says, that, that wasn't God's way, right? The scriptures tell us that Abraham believed God. And God counted him as righteous because of his faith. We've got to make sure we don't get this backwards. The reason why Abraham was so incredible wasn't because of what he did. It was because of what he believed. What he believed drove what he did. But there's a real big distinction here. How do you become made right with God? Is it by what you do? And he said, no, that's not God's way. It's not by what you do. If it's by what you do, you can stand before God and say, hey, why do I deserve to go to heaven? Look what I've done. And, and then who gets the glory? You do. He said, no. That's not what it's about. Abraham was imperfect. He got a lot of things along the way, many failures. He had doubts. But you see, Christianity is not about your ability to do everything right. Christianity is about your willingness to believe that God can do what he promises. Christianity is not about your ability to do everything right. right? It's about your willingness to believe that God can do what he promises. You say, well, I can't, I can't do this. I, you know, this being a Christian thing, I'm, I, can't, I can't do that. You're right, you can't. It's, it's not what this is about. You see, our whole relationship with God is not based on what you do. And that's counterintuitive, right? We think we have to do good to be accepted by people or to be loved or those. But he's saying that that's not the case. This Romans goes on, he's talking about Abraham, he said, he says, when people work, their wages aren't a gift, but it's something they've earned. But people are counted righteous because of their work, not because of their work, rather, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. So as you think about that, and as you look at what he's saying there, it's pretty crazy. You see that God is telling us that he doesn't he doesn't accept you because of what you do. He accepts you because of what Jesus did. There's, there's, a, there's another passage that goes on, and, and, and it says in, in verse 8, it says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. What's that word impute? Impute's a word we don't use much today, but it means to put to one's account. In other words, what happens is when we sin, it's put to our account, and how can we pay the debt of that sin we can't? But when we give our lives to Christ, that sin is not put to our account. It's put to Jesus' account. You understand what that means? It means that God loves you even when you mess up. It means that when you mess up, God knows and expects that you're going to mess up. But it means that God takes that and your sin, he's given you a righteousness that's apart from what you do. It doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. Your sin doesn't just go away. God doesn't say, oh, that's okay. No, he takes your sin and he puts it to Jesus' account. And that account was paid for on the cross. Now, the crazy thing about this story is it's not just about Abraham. He tells us it's about us too. Romans 4.23 says, when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us righteous if we do what? Live a perfect life? No. If we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. 
It means that I'm going to believe in God even though I believe God can forgive me. I'm going to believe that God loves me even when I may not love me. I'm going to believe that God can can do something with my life more than, than what I deserve. I believe that God can make me his child. I believe that that, that God can keep his promises. The key to this is, are we just going to believe God or not? It's the simplest thing in the world to say, but are we going to believe God is God? Are we going to believe in him? Are we going to believe he keeps his promises? Are we going to believe that he is good? And that belief begins to affect our actions. And we find ourselves on this journey that's so amazing, right? It's so cool as we begin to see God step in and work in our lives time after time after time after time. Not because we deserve it, because we don't. But because he keeps his promises. God honors our belief in him. So let's wrap it up. God tests Abraham. And God will allow tests to come in your life. The question when these come, am I going to believe God? And obedience is the test of faith. How could Abraham do something like this, take his son to do something like this? He believed God keeps his promises. And we need to believe that too. There are so many ways that God wants to speak to us. And there's so many promises that are there for us. And we see that Abraham wasn't made righteous because of what he believed. He was, because of what he did, he was made righteous because of what he believed. And he's telling us that this was all done, God sharing this story with us to, to challenge us to believe him too. We have this whole history throughout the Bible, and then we have this whole history in our lives where God has worked and God has earned the right to be trusted and earned the right to be believed. Now the question is, are we going to have faith like Abraham and believe him? Let's pray. Most holy God, I thank you so much for, for who and all that you are. God, I thank you for sharing this story. And God, uh, we need it. We need to just be reminded that it's not about our abilities. It's not about any of those things. It's, it's about just believing that, that you're God and believing that you love us and believing that you can forgive us and believing that you want to do things for us, believing that you have a purpose and a plan for our lives, believing that, that you're good, believing that there's a plan overall. And God, knowing that someday, God, that, that, that this as messed up as this world is, that we get to be your children and that we get to spend an eternity with you in a world that's the way you wanted it originally to be. God, there are so many needs right now for, for those who are watching online and those who are here with us right now. So many things, we, we, it's hard for us. We, we, sometimes we, we feel like that guy in Mark where it says we believe, help our unbelief. We, we, we want to be there. God, help us just to, to read your word and then God instill a faith in us that enables us to do more than we ever believed, to believe more than we ever thought. God, we love you, and I pray that you meet each need that's here today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I'd like to invite you just to stand. And uh, we're just going to have a time just for you just to think about what you've heard. Just like when I was reading my Bible and there were things that maybe jumped out to me that because of where I was in that moment, that if you read, read wouldn't jump out to you. Um, there may be some things that you heard this morning that as you heard them, you know that that was God kind of challenging you or speaking to you or encouraging you. I, I want to encourage you to listen. It's such a cool thing when God does that. Let's reach out to him this morning and uh, just
You say, God, I believe. This time is yours. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you said. Though the storm may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting sun, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. You know, at some point, we just have to decide, am I going to believe or am I not going to believe? It's a choice, right? It's a choice that changes everything in our lives. Making a decision that I'm going to believe God. Looking back on all the reasons why, and there's so many reasons why. Watch and see what happens in your life as we begin to understand just how great God's faithfulness is. Most holy God, we want to tell you that we love you this morning. I want to thank you that while we don't always get it right and we may let you down, you, you always keep your promises. I want to thank you that even when I don't understand and each of us go through things that are hard that we may not understand, that we can with confidence know that you are good and we can trust you. God, give us, help us to be patient. God, help us to, to read your word so that our faith can grow. And God, we just ask you to speak to us and help us to hear you as, as, as you do. God, thank you for meeting so many needs in our lives. Help us just to be thankful and to realize that remembering what you've done can so encourage us about what you can do. We love you today. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks and be seated. We are so glad that you joined us today and glad you joined us online. Um, we have a busy afternoon. Again, if you're able to stay great, if you can't, we certainly understand. Uh, there are just a lot of little things that need to be done, and then we'll get started with the week. Again, I'd like to invite you to stop by this week and just stop in and uh, take a look and see what's going on. It's a lot of fun to see all the energy and excitement that these kids have. This place will be rocking Monday night. I can tell you that. They are going to be jumping and singing and have, having fun, and they're going to be learning about Jesus. And uh, how cool is that? So thanks again for all of your help. Let's stand. Let's be dismissed with a song. Be praying about VBS and Upward Soccer, which so appreciate it. Let's be dismissed with a song. darkness whose love is mighty and so 
shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is amazing love that you would take my place. All that you've done for me. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next week, we'll serve your King.